I got all the birthday feels. It's my birthday on Saturday. Hello everyone. Welcome to AC Cook's live Instagram version. Uh, planes are flying overhead. Vicky and Madeline are manning the cameras. Welcome to our YouTube audience as well. Uh, a lot of folks taking off tomorrow. Uh, so this is almost like a special weekend edition, even though it's our regular Thursday time, uh, which is fantastic. We're going to be cooking uh, a super simple uh, steak and asparagus meal, uh, but I think a lot of really cool tips for folks. And if you are a newcomer uh, to our uh, website or a lot of the things that we cook, uh, here in our kitchen studio, uh, we're gonna show you a sauce that is going to become an all-purpose favorite of yours that you will keep in your fridge at all times, for all purposes, for all of eternity. That's how ridiculously delicious it is. Um, but we also have something really important to talk about, which we'll get into a little more later on, but that is, is that we're trying to raise uh, awareness and dollars around the issue of chemical dependency, alcoholism, and drug addiction. You know, right now we're living in very uncertain and ambiguous times. And this is not a left or right issue. It's not a red or blue uh, issue. Uh, this is an all of us issue. Uh, addiction numbers rising, alcoholism numbers rising, uh, trauma, especially with younger people and kids rising. Um, we are seeing uh, record numbers of mental health uh, issues in this country and it's going to get worse. And I suffer from several mental health illnesses. Uh, and one of the primary ones in which uh, I count recovery days is alcoholism and drug addiction. I'm very public about that. I'm 28 and a half years sober. Uh, and there is a treatment center uh, out here uh, in Minnesota called The Retreat. And we have an Andrew Zimmern scholarship fund there that is geared towards helping people, especially those who are coming uh, out of the food industry, um, so that if you can't afford treatment, you can get treatment. And we have given away over the years a lot of scholarships. So thank you to everyone at The Retreat. I'm urging you, please go to theretreat.org. There's a donate button. You can see you, the Andrew Zimmern Scholarship Fund is right there. You can go to our website. We have links there. More about it later, but please, 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 please help people who can't afford access recovery uh, get that first uh, bite at that apple. Anyway, uh, on to what we are doing. Um, I think the first thing that I'm going to do is uh, prep our meat. Um, now, I will tell you, uh, very typically, uh, I, I buy big chunks of meat like this, and then I do different things that I want to do with it. Um, this is a two-bone piece of bone-in ribeye. Um, and it is a beauty, uh, some stunning, uh, it's sweating, uh, which is why it looks glistening, but it's some really nice uh, uh, aged prime beef. And you can see here, the chine, C-H-I-N-E, bone is removed. And I always check that. There's nothing worse than cutting through with a knife and realizing that you needed to take a cleaver because whoever prepped the giant primal cut didn't cut all the way through that bone. But, and there's a little remnant of a piece of that chine bone, but it will cut all the way through. Now, if I have three or four people coming over for dinner, I'll actually cook this entire thing because it allows me, whether I'm using indirect heat or direct heat, whether I'm going conventional sear or reverse sear, it allows me to keep the meat in greater contact with the heat source. And the more that you can do that, the better. Even better than that is if you have the bone on, because when that bone roasts on the grill, it imparts scorched bone flavors into the meat that it's next to, which is why bone-in chicken tastes better than boneless chicken, right? However, I'm trying to teach you also about a practical element, which is how to cook a perfect piece of beef. So I am just gonna cut this in half and we're gonna cook these steaks on the grill. Each one of these is about 18 ounces and it's about two inches thick. 
Um, first thing that I want to do is I want to give it a generous, oh, it's a beautiful sunny day in Minnesota. I've got a motorcycle and a plane overhead at the same time. I would like to be on either one of those. I'm just gonna put a generous amount of salt and pepper. And I'm gonna do this on both sides. I have my grill, my coals, natural hardwood charcoal already going. If you are doing something else, that's fine. But I like nice high heat for this. I am not, repeat, not going to reverse sear. I'm actually gonna do this in a different style. One that results in my favorite piece of beef, which is black and sort of blue. Um, I like my beef, especially good beef, black and blue, which is a cool red center. Not a lot of people are, or I guess I'm into it more than a lot of my friends. I am using direct heat with this. I'm gonna get a lot of fat dripping off of that. You can already see the sooty flare up starting. So I am going to make sure that I keep these moving until I can put them safely in a place near the heat where I feel I'm not gonna get as many sooty flare ups. Now, the idea here is to monitor your beef. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's pretty simple. I don't wanna walk away from this and start doing a crossword puzzle and watch this really expensive meat incinerate on the grill. But if I keep it moving and get a really nice crust on both sides, I can move it just off center right, where it's not getting those sooty flare-ups. And guess what's gonna happen then? I'm gonna be able to cook it to where it's charred on the outside. Thank you. Oh, it's a FedEx plane. Uh, where it's charred on the outside and still rare on the inside. I'm gonna let it rest to the temperature I like. And look at that, we have that gorgeous brown caramelization. The blackening that you see there is actually where there's more fat, where it dripped down and actually scorched on there. So we gave our grill a nice clean. So I know that this is a little hotter than this area over here. And while that's happening, I'm gonna prep some other goodies that I'm gonna make. Um, I have some asparagus here. I'm gonna reserve these to the freezer for another use. Just a little bit of olive oil. I mean, a little bit. And a little bit of salt. And I'm just gonna coat those. And those are going to go right where the steak was. And while the meat is resting and the asparagus are cooking, I'm gonna make my sauce. You can see where that fire is, is where bits of the fat from the beef drip down into there. But I'm managing it to avoid the sooty flare of, look where my tongs are. Look at how gorgeous and brown that is. We're just managing our cooking here. And now, bone side towards the hottest part of the fire. Because remember, here, it's still pretty hot, right? So I'm just gonna let those continue to cook on that side. I'm gonna cook them on the other side. And what I'm gonna put down, as I said, where the... That always happens and it kills me. I put my asparagus down right over the high heat because we're grilling our asparagus as well. 
and I am going to make a classic uh, Japanese miso sauce that is served in places that grill beef and grill vegetables. Familiar to anyone who cooks a lot of Japanese food. God, the asparagus this time of year is just so nice. Every time I turn it, I want that bone side towards the hottest part of the heat. And we know that's here where that mound of charcoal is. I actually dumped it off center. So if I needed to, I have a cool zone. I could just put something over there. That's 280, 325 degrees, right? So, so delicious. All right, and then all I wanna do is just rotate my asparagus a little bit. How do you know when your beef is cooked? Well, two things, experience or a thermometer. And I would encourage those of you that are buying expensive cuts of beef, well, really any cut of beef is expensive these days. If you're spending 20 to $200 for a steak, please, by all means, buy a $7 meat thermometer. Um, and you'll know on your grill with your coals what works for you, right? That experience. There is also something that all chefs do where we hold our hands and we say, look, when we make a fist, that's medium rare. And when we make a tight fist, that's well done. And when we make no fist at all, that's rare. Well, that only works with mushy cuts of beef, right? Like beef tenderloin. It's not really the case with something like an 18 ounce, 20 ounce bone in ribeye, which feels firm to the touch because it's so thick, but I know it's still nice and rare on the inside. And what I'm shooting for What I'm shooting for is letting it rest to in between rare and medium rare. So I'm gonna take these off in about 90 seconds or two minutes. My asparagus is perfectly done. So much easier to pull it off than to put it on. So we're gonna let that just rest over there. And while the steak is cooking, I'm gonna cook my sauce. Three egg yolks. My miso. I think this is three quarters of a cup or a cup. Recipe is on the website at andrewzimmern.com, by the way. I'm gonna throw in, you can use dashi, I have found that the liquid part of this recipe is tougher for first time cooks to get behind. Uh, so I started using the dashi, dashi no moto, which is the uh, crystals of evaporated dashi, um, my sugar, and my sake. And I'm going to whisk this together. and I'm gonna heat it until the sauce tightens up and the eggs thicken and liaise the sauce itself. So, where, oh where, <laughs> That's a beautiful cut of meat. And by the time it rests, it should be a beautiful medium rare. And 
I'm going to put a little water. Here, just to insulate my sauce a little bit from this heat. I used to make this sauce exclusively in a double boiler that I set up. Bowl with sitting on a pot is absolutely fine. Um, and the reason that I'm setting it in some water now, because these days, I do it right over open flame because the sauce is so stable. Even though it's an egg-based sauce, the sauce is so incredibly stable, it won't curdle on you. But I'm cooking with, you know, 800, 900 degrees here. So I wanna make sure that we stay really, really careful with this as we can. And this sauce is going to emulsify. See how hot our water is getting. Not hot enough, I can tell you that. But you can literally do everything. You know, not everyone has a side burner on their fancy, expensive stove uh, grill. But even if you have one of these Weber kettles or another brand, or even if you're over an open campfire with a Tuscan grill or some kind of grate over it, you're gonna be able to make this sauce. All right, so. Give me one second, I'm gonna grab another plate and we'll start dealing with setting this up. Hold on. All right. Hold on, my phone is too hot. I need to cool down. Phone's too hot. Vicki, how's your phone? We didn't, we didn't. We didn't count on the hot temperature in the uh, parking lot, which is where we are. That's where Madeline and Vicky are standing just inside the sun in the parking lot. This is the back side of our test kitchen. That's the front side of our test kitchen where we actually do uh, AZ cooks most of the time. Uh, all right. We're back. We're back! <laughs> um, is that some sort of like, a, you know, abusive employee situation? Putting Madeline, uh, congratulations, just had a baby. Um, and Vicky. Um, I didn't have a baby. Did not have a baby. <laughs> Vicky wants me to let everyone know very, her, Vicky's family is watching from Spain. Uh, hello, Vicky's family. We love your daughter very much here at the office. Um, but I just, I just want to be very clear. She did not have a baby. Um, how are we doing there? Oh yeah, water's getting hot. And by the way, you can smell the egg yolks as they thicken. But the other thing you can do is use a thermometer because once you get up to 160, 170, those egg yolks are gonna be setting. All right. This is super safe sitting there on top of our coals. So first thing that we wanna do is cut our asparagus. And what I do is I line up the bottoms of them. And put a nice little bundle there. And then I take the tops of them and put them on top of that nice little bundle as best we can. 
If one falls, don't sit there for hours trying to make it look nice. The idea here is just to put these beautiful pieces with all those tips on the top. And I like to have the tips of my asparagus facing out, right? It's already seasoned, so we don't have to worry about that. This is starting to thicken. It probably only has a couple more minutes. Oh yeah. It's getting warmer. And we're gonna wait to the very last minute to cut into our beef. The reason is the longer the beef rests, the better. And if you have watched uh, me cook beef before, you've probably heard me say, I actually prefer room temperature uh, cooked beef than I do warm or hot grilled beef. There is a national chain premium steakhouse that serves their beef on sizzling platters. And I can't understand for the life of me why anyone um, goes there because the fact of the matter is you order a steak one way and by the time it gets to you, it's not that way. And then it keeps cooking, which is crazy to me. Um, I like to cook to one temperature, let it rest to another. Uh, and then I like to slice it so I get pieces of all the meat because you have that beautiful rib cap and then you have the two different muscles, including the eye of the ribeye, right? So this is that beautiful cap. This is a different muscle and this is a third muscle. There's actually a couple little ones on either side, but it's generally three muscles. And this round piece is that eye. Right there is my favorite little piece, but it always gets a little overdone. I, I shouldn't say that I like part of the cap. No, I should, I, I like all of it. I like the part that's next to the bone that's really rare, but tastes really of the beef. Andrew, you had a lot of questions of why did you shave? Oh my gosh. People were liking the beard. Oh my gosh, I hated shaving. Um, I, bl I have to blame my career. So, um, people know that I'm doing a, uh, a couple of different shows right now. Uh, MSNBC, by the way, is rerunning What's Eating America starting this Saturday at 10 o'clock uh, Eastern and for the next five weeks uh, after that. Uh, Jose Andres and I explore immigration this Saturday night at 10, so set your DVRs or whatever if you're gonna be watching fireworks somewhere. Um, socially distance and with a mask, I hope. Um, but I'm also shooting a show for Magnolia Network that premieres in Q1 uh, 2021, and it's called Family Dinner. And we shot the first half of the season and went great. And then we put our cameras and closed our office. We just wrap, just shut her down for three and a half months like everyone else. And we just started shooting again. So I had to shave so that the first part of the season matches the second part of the season for like show promos and stuff like that. All right. This tightened right up and you can see that now when I pull my whisk through it, it actually is one temperature, or sorry, one texture. It's thicker, let me show you that. See when I pull it through, it actually holds its shape a little bit. It tastes of a liaise sauce with cooked egg. And I can tell by putting my finger in it, it's hot. I'm actually gonna put the lid on that. All right, so next thing that we wanna do, my little scallion garnish over there. Take out my slicer. I guess I could, well, let's put that there. Move my beautiful scallions that are gonna garnish this over there. And the first thing that I'm going to do 
is take the bone off. Now, some people love the charry ends of the bone. I happen to be one of them. So I'm gonna put that, I'll leave that right there. Then take a spoon. I'm gonna reverse this so that you all can see it a little better. And I'm gonna put three spoonfuls of my sauce down there. Now, it's a strong sauce. So I just want three tablespoons on the plate. I will take this sauce at my house and just put it in the middle of the table so that everyone can uh, get more if they want more, especially if they're going to be having uh, seconds. And then all I'm going to do is slice my beef into half inch slices. And I'm gonna take two slices from that cap and a nice centerpiece, nice warm interior. That's that black and blued piece of this equation. And just a little bit of salt to finish it. We seasoned it so it's got salt on the crust there, but I wanna put a little bit there and then the fresh scallion with that miso sauce is so, so, so delicious. And with beef, it is a, it is a holy trinity that you do not want to miss out on when it comes uh, to flavor. You can see here, by the way, from a carving board standpoint, that we have rested this to a really nice sort of black and blue, as I said at the beginning, right? You want a little more? No problem. We did this, this was, we let our meat come to room temperature. We had it on for about, oh, three or four minutes aside, then moved it to a, a colder part of the grill and let it go for another two or three minutes aside. Um, with a two inch piece of beef like this, another two or three minutes total and then letting it rest and we'd be looking at a whole different temperature. Once you get the inside of the beef up to 70, 80, 90, 100 degrees, starts to get warm, it will start taking off and cooking very fast. The beef on the grill will go from 100 to 135, faster than it will go from 65 to 100, even though it's both 35 degree jumps. Make sense, right? Once it starts to get going, it starts to get going. So, um, questions, comments, thoughts, procedures, recipe is on our website. Please hit that link at uh, theretreat.org and donate to help those who can't afford access uh, to uh, affordable treatment to get it. Um, and by the way, there are so many people out there who've lost their jobs, who don't have an extra dollar, and I would tell you please, please, please don't send money. What I would ask you to do is go and take that link and email it to all your friends. Put it on your social, right? Some of us can raise awareness. Others of us can write a check. I'm not asking for everyone to give money. What I am asking is for everyone to get involved. That's the nature of civics. Just get involved. Anyway, questions, let's have them. What or who motivates you when everything is just a mess? What motivates me to what when everything is just a mess? What or who motivates you when everything is just a mess? Oh my mess? God, my kid. Um, my son is the just the hardest working person I know. Uh, he has uh, a lot of issues in his life and he works so, so hard um, on them. And, you know, I speak to him almost every day and I get a chance to uh, see what he's doing in his life. 
And if he's working that hard, it's easy for me. The next thing that I do is I look at the world around me and I see how hard other people are working. It fills me with gratitude. I make a gratitude list every single morning uh, when I get up. Um, and I also have a spiritual system at work in my life. Um, and I think everyone, you know, for some people it's yoga, for some people it's exercising, for some people it's their family, for other people it's church. But you gotta have something. You have to have something that tells you that everything's gonna be okay. And if you don't have something in your life that you can regularly rely on to communicate back to you that everything is gonna be okay, you need to find one. So talking about your recovery, yep. how do you cope when being around alcohol? Like mm. By overeating, I'm kidding. Okay. Um, That is a dynamite question. How do I cope being around alcohol considering I'm 28 years sober? Um, if you do the things that you need to do to maintain your recovery, and it's different for everyone, uh, then the problem, which is always there, ceases to become an issue for you one day at a time by doing things, and I'm very heavily involved in service uh, and recovery, head, ass, and overcoat, um, and have been. I'm, I'm absolutely scared to death of stepping away from my recovery because by investing myself in my recovery, it, all, it, it, it is as if the problem is removed. The problem's not actually removed. My disease is inside of me doing push-ups. I know that but I take my medicine all the time. I'm transparent, I go to 12 step meetings, I talk to other people, and I have a recovering lifestyle. So that's the most important thing. As long as you're doing what you need to be doing, the problem is removed, or as if the pro your life appears as if the problem is removed. You're always an arm's length away from a drink. So I try to be very careful about it. What did you season the steak with? Salt and pepper. Super simple, super, super simple. This is a very random question, but they're asking you if you could be any tree, which one would you be? It's really funny because my first higher power was a tree at my treatment center. Um, I would be a red maple. When I was growing up, a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, uh, had a red maple in the circle in the middle of their family driveway. Um, and it must have been 150 years old. It was massive. I mean, just four people standing joined hands could probably get around it. And it was just massive and just giant. And in the middle of the summer, the leaves were so dark. It was just so beautiful. I just love that tree. If you could be anywhere in the world right now, where would you be and what would you be eating? Ah. I've thought about this a lot. Um, because we can't travel, all the choice is narrow. Um, I need to be on a beach somewhere. The most beautiful beach that I've been on in my life, maybe, is Lalu Manu Beach uh, in Samoa. And you can rent a fale there, like a little tree house, for like $8 a night, by the way, that come, that's with food. And uh, some of the young boys that hang out on the beach uh, who were part of the Mate's tribe. They're small little tribal families all around the island. Each one has a Mate or chief. And nearby Lalumanu Beach, the young boys at a very early age learned to dive and spear fish and pull up lobsters and shrimp and all kinds of things, clams and whatever. And so you sit on that beach and they'll get you fruit that's ripening in the trees. They'll get you fish from the ocean. You can cook it, they can cook it. It's just, in, it's 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 Robinson Crusoe paradise uh, that has cell phone service, but I would probably turn my phone off. Lie, I never turn my phone off. What's your favorite place to source beef from? Oh my gosh, so many incredible purveyors out there. Um, I mean, Flannery Beef, Peterson, Anya Fernald at Bell. Campo, D'Artagnan, 
uh, La Frida, Snake River Farms, uh, uh, the new company down in Miami that's outside of Miami is raising uh, Wagyu, um, uh, Rancho Grande Castle Rock, uh, Castle Rock Rancho Grande. Um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Um, I would tell you that one of the great uh, benefits in our food world for those seeking restaurant quality ingredients, I just saw a statistic on one of my uh, uh, financial services emails that specialty foods have gone up in sales 300% uh, over the last quarter. And that's because more and more people are cooking at home. And a lot of these companies that were selling only to restaurants now have mail order, right? So some of the finest restaurants in the world right, are, you know, getting their meat from a handful of small websites or a handful of small farmers. And now those farmers have figured out a way to change their distribution model. So go online, Google it, start looking at farmers, start following chefs, scroll back in their feeds and see where they're buying, right? Um, it's, it's just, there is no better time. I can't remember when there were this many great options. Does music ever inspire you to cook cer certain dishes? Oh my God, yes. We can't play music here because of licensing issues, uh, but I'm a huge music geek. I love to play guitar. Um, just bought myself a new one for a birthday present. You're gonna have to wait till Saturday to see what it is. Um, and I listen to music all the time in many, many, many genres. Um, and. I, I don't like put on Edith Piaf and cook French food, right? <laughs> or, or you know, listen to a dead show from the early 70s and try to make something a little hippy dippy uh, trippy. Uh, that's not really how it works. Um, but it is part of my sense memory and it does inspire me because it brings me back to a certain point in my life and then I'll think about a certain food and then I'll start cooking that food. Um, and mostly I like to put on albums when <laughs> musicians were making albums some still do today uh but where everything's sort of meant sign and i just lose myself in it while i'm cooking because cooking is my yoga that's where i just focus on the cooking and not on everything else are you going to write another az world explorer book someone we, was asking we, for their kids we are we're actually uh in negotiations right now to do it as a book and companion podcast which is very exciting well that answers another question because don't you think kids need a podcast like a real one they're asking you if you're ever going to do another podcast i am going to do another podcast and we're figuring that out right now the podcasting world has just gotten crazy i mean there's millions of them and there are so many good ones but we need to shake the wheat from the chaff i think there are certain communities that are being underserved kids being one of them and so i think i'm going to try to fill that void what kind of dessert would you serve with this meal something super light i mean it's beef right it's rich and the sauce is you know you just use a little bit of it in the asparagus um so i would and i'd probably serve a second vegetable in them like roasted eggplants just cut in half with lemon and olive oil and maybe some Calabrian chili or something. Uh, but I would serve something super light like a lemon granita or a, a fresh fruit granita. I, I've, I've found over the last three or four months, almost every other night I'm making a granita because I'm home, right? So what I do is I uh, will take the skin off four or five peaches. I will buzz the peaches, I mean blitz them in the uh, blender. Then uh, I will strain it, season it with a little bit of sugar, a little bit of lemon juice, um, put a little bit of uh, homemade uh, simple syrup in it. If you don't have that, a little light corn syrup will do. Um, and uh, stir it together and then pour it into a metal brownie pan, right? And stick it in the freezer. And then every 10, 15 minutes, I open it up and sort of whisk it back and forth. And in about an hour and a half, you have this pile of homemade granita in the flavor of whatever fruit you use. You do with, I did it with cantaloupe the other night. I've done it with peaches. I do it with watermelon, tons of them. And you just, it's so easy. I mean, it's the easiest dessert in the world and you look like a huge pro and it's absolutely light and refreshing 
and delicious. If you could learn any language fluently, what would it be? If I could learn any language fluently, what would it be? Chinese. Why? I love Chinese culture. Um, I speak a little bit of Spanish, I speak a little bit of French, so I, I, I'd like to prepare myself also for, I think, engaging in the next half of my life in, in a next act with some sort of diplomacy, hands across the world thing. I, I really believe that the country that we need to, I mean, look what's going on with the United States and Russia, right? It's crazy. But I do think that uh, there's a lot of work to be done in international diplomacy, and I'm interested in doing something with the Chinese government. What time do you usually go to sleep? I go to sleep at about midnight, one in the morning, and I get up about seven, 6.30 or seven. Would you rather go to space or to the bottom of the ocean? Space. Bottom of the ocean, look, is the bottom of the ocean is super cool. And isn't it that one lady who just went uh, up in the space station is the only person who's been to the bottom of the ocean and to space. Uh, so we really should ask her. She's the only person qualified. Um, but I've, I've wanted to go to space since I was a little kid. I think I told this story before when it was the anniversary of Neil Armstrong's uh, walk on the moon. But when, when, when Neil Armstrong stepped out onto the lunar surface and we finally put a man on the moon, I was seven or eight years old. We were at uh, my friend Adam Green's parents' house. There were about a hundred families there. And I sat, I was sitting in my dad's lap. He was sitting uh, crisscross applesauce and I was in his lap and he had his arms around me. Neil Armstrong stepped out on to the moon. We heard Walter Cronkite. We heard him say, you know, one small step for man, uh, for man, one giant leap for mankind. And my father looked up and then he tilted my head and he said, he's up there. And I just, I've never forgotten that moment. And I, you know, I'm 59, I'm part of, or I'll be 59. I'm part of that generation that has, you know, we went through all of these efforts to put a man on the moon. And it was one of the greatest things. It was a real piece of uh, our culture that we could all be proud of. What do you collect that no one knows about? <laughs> well, I think I've said it a couple times, but uh, on Bizarre Foods, I did a lot of hunting, I ate a lot of wild animals, and I would always have the scrotum uh, of those animals uh, salted and taxidermied. Uh, so in a corner of my office, I have uh, a whole bunch of animal ball sacks, which I just think is juvenile, but also charming, uh, kind of like me. And uh, what else do I uh, collect? Well, I collect guitars. Um, I collect knives. I don't know if I've ever really copped all of that. Uh, 19th century uh, historical prints. I collect those. I don't think I've ever confessed to that. But I did my thesis in college on the daguerreotype, the generic predecessor to the photograph, and its ramifications towards defining cultural nationalism in pre-Civil War America. And my concentration in art history and history was in uh, second half 19th century, uh, American history, European painting. So that era really fascinates me. And I collect prints from that time. There, I said it. What's your favorite guitar? Oh my God, what's my favorite guitar? I just, it's the one that I don't have. I, I just bought uh, an old uh, Gibson ES-335. Uh, I have the, you know, the gold, Strat. I've got all the tellies. I've got all of that stuff. I have a really beautiful acoustic guitar, but I just saw on Retro Fret a 1938 uh, Martin flat top that uh, is for sale. And those guitars uh, from that Martin was making in the 30s are just beyond fantastic. So, and they have a sound and a tone to them that's crazy. Do you want to do one more question? I would like to do one more question. I would like to tell people, again, theretreat.org, make a donation, even if it's $5, help someone 
afford uh, access uh, to uh, a recovering lifestyle by helping them get to treatment. Uh, the need is greater than ever in these ambiguous and uncertain times. But most importantly, really, truly, I mean this from the bottom of my heart, go to the retreat.org, cut and paste that landing page in your, in, from your browser, put it in an email and mail it to everyone on your list. Put it in your social. Tell other people to do it. I don't expect everyone to donate. These are really hard times in our country. Unemployment is at a ridiculous high. We, none of us know what's happening from one day to the next. I, I, I get it. I'm not asking everyone to write a check. If you can, do it. If you can't, tell other people about it. The need is great. It's your family member, it's your next door neighbor, it's your work colleague that's hurting and is gonna need that scholarship. Okay, last question. What's your son's favorite dish that you make? Oh, <laughs> hmm. The, I think the thing that I make that my son loves the most uh, which I'm really grateful for because it's my favorite dish is my grandmother's roast chicken. I finally got him to the point where he craves that and wants me to make that for him, which took a long time in coming. For a while, he wasn't into the gravy, the pan gravy, and I was like, what do you mean you're not into the pan? Yeah! You're not a Zimmern. But now he's really into it. So yes, thank you for asking that question. And a happy, happy 4th of July uh, to everyone. Go to the retreat.org, help us spread the message, be an awareness raiser, or be a uh, donor to the scholarship funds so that we can help get people affordable recovery if they so choose it.